For those of you who didn't hear what I said, <laughs> I'm very grateful to God, very seriously grateful for this privilege. I really mean that from my heart. I thank him for it. The honor of preaching is an honor angels would love to exercise, but it's denied to them and given to human beings. So I thank God for it, and I will do my best under the direction, the guidance of his spirit to present his word plainly, boldly, directly, without any fear, but with compassion, because I too am a sinner. I observe that, uh, and I speak very bluntly sometimes, but blunt speaking saves time. Um, you seem to be quite noisy. And I don't do well when a worship environment is noisy. And I suspect God doesn't do well either. So I will appeal to you as children of God to be reverent. You want to say something, say amen. Um, but other than that, let me do the speaking. When I see you talking, it bothers me, it disturbs me. And uh, God knows I speak the truth. And I wanted to let you know that without any mingling of words, that I like to preach in a reverent atmosphere. The Spirit of God is the most sensitive member of the Godhead. The Bible says, any word spoken against the Son will be forgiven, but if you speak against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven in this world, neither in the world. So the Holy Ghost is very sensitive. He leaves quickly and does not come back quickly. So we don't want to drive him away by a lack of reverence. I don't know if it's in the culture to be noisy, but if it is, please don't practice that culture uh, when I'm in the desk. And when Pastor Bohr either, he'll probably tell you the same thing. It is now, what is it? A quarter to five? All right. I'll be done before 5.30, I promise you that. Uh, my policy when I preach, when I've said what I have to say, stop. Uh, those of you who are in theology schools, remember that. When you've said what you have to say, stop. Don't just speak to occupy time. Speak to make a point. And when you've made it, anything else will just ruin it. So I, when I'm done, I'm done. And you can go on the trails I heard someone talk about <laughs> earlier. How many of you are not Seventh-day Adventists? Can I see your hands? You are not a Seventh-day Adventist. May I see your hand? No one? All those of you who are Seventh-day Adventists, may I see your hands? All right, hands down. Uh, before I go any further, do three things for me. Favors, I call them. Favor number one, I'd like you to turn off all cell phones. Anything that makes a noise, please turn them off. Not down, off. Let me explain why I want them off, and it's a request from a guest. If you turn it down and it vibrates or does whatever it does, curiosity will lead you to check to see who's calling. And when you look furtively to see who's calling, the person next to you will look to see what you're looking at. And uh, that will cause disturbance. So please, you won't turn your phones on in a courtroom. Don't turn them on in the presence of God. So I suspect, I believe, I hope, I trust that all phones have been turned off. Favor number two, while I'm speaking, I'd like you to pray for me. What I'd like you to say is, Lord, put your words in that man's mouth. That is based on Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 9. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. My words have no power. They cannot save and they perhaps will hurt. But the words of God will save. They will rebuke. They will cut, but they will heal and restore, enlighten and save. And so I want to speak God's words, not mine. And favor number three, I want you to think. And this request is based on Isaiah 118, where the Bible says, Come now and let us do what? Reason together. To reason means to employ the faculty that lifts us above the level of the animals. We can think and reason. And by the thinking, the reasoning, the choices we make, we develop the character God desires us to work out through the power of his spirit. Let's pray now. Loving Father in heaven, in the name of Jesus Christ, a name you always accept, we come before you. 
We ask you first, dear God, forgive us where we have offended you, where we have sinned. Forgive us, dear Father. Yes, we sin very often, but your word says you're long-suffering. And so pardon us one more time. With the forgiveness, give us power that we may not repeat whatever it was we did. Father, we've gathered to listen to your word. And as I try to deliver this message, I ask you, dear God, please help me. Put your words in my mouth. Remember the promise you made to Moses in Exodus chapter 4 verse 12 when you said to him, Now therefore go, and I will be with thy mouth, and teach thee what thou shalt say. Teach me, God, and give me the spirit to listen and to speak only as your spirit leads and convicts. Bless every person under the sound of my voice. Bless the English Language Institute Father's School, the Foreign Language School, and the mission for which it was established. When this weekend is over, let us all leave this place drawn closer to your bosom, more committed to the cause of the gospel. I offer this prayer from my heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Our subject for this afternoon, promise and power. Promise and power. I was reading your mission statement on the internet, and at the end of that page, the statement says, or there's a statement, the command and commission of Christ is given to us. And then Matthew 28, 18 to 20 is quoted. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. That's a command. And I'll say something about a command, every command from God, how we ought to view it. But I'll leave that verse right there. And I want you to listen to Hebrews chapter 4, verse 2. Or you can turn to it in your Bibles. Hebrews chapter 4. We read verse 2. Have you found Hebrews? Chapter 4, verse 2. The Bible says, For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. Listen again to what the Bible says. For unto us, those in the days of the Apostle Paul, was the gospel preached as well as unto them, who is them, the Israelites wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. Unto us, the same gospel preached in the days of Paul was preached to the Israelites because there's only one gospel. But the word preached did not profit them. Not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. How is that possible? Particularly when you understand what the gospel is. Let's go to Romans chapter 1. We shall read verse 18. Our subject is promise and power. Romans chapter 1, reading verse 18. The Bible says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Why? For it is what? The power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. To the Jew first. And also to the Greek. The Bible says the gospel is the power of God. That same power that said let there be light and there was light. That same power that said Lazarus come forth. That same power that brought Christ from the second death. Is the power of the gospel. Ephesians 1 verse 19 says, And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ, when he raised him from the dead? The power that brought Christ from the second death is the very power in the gospel that works in the life of the person who receives it. Yet the Bible says the word preached did not profit them. How could all the power of God not profit someone? Not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. 
There are two ways to hear, with your ear or with your heart. You can hear and not heed. Are you with me? When the word of God is preached and spoken and read, we ought to heed. And so unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them. I want to talk about the school for which you work. The Samyuk Foreign Language School, is that one of its names? You have gathered this weekend because you're facing challenges. If I'm right, am I right, yes or no? Yes. You're facing challenges with the school. And you've gathered, presumably to recommit yourselves to God, to look more closely at the mission of the school, the reason why you came, the potency of your commitment to the work of God. Did you come because the pay is respectable? Did you come because vacations are paid and there's the opportunity to go traveling all through Southeast Asia? Did you come to get away from your family? Did you come to find a spouse? Why did you come? Why is the school facing challenges? How could something face a challenge when it's backed up by the power of God? And how can there be discouragement among people who presumably have a relationship with a God who can simply say, let there be light? And there was light. How? Hebrews 4, 2 tells us the reason why all the power of God, that's what the gospel is, did not profit the Israelites. The problem did not lie with the poor preached. Because to say the problem lay with the gospel is to say the problem is resident in God. And it is not. Whenever things go wrong among us, whenever there's conflict between us and God, the problem is always with us. The Bible says in Psalm 145 verse 17, The Lord is righteous in all his ways and holy in all his works. So he is always right. Contrary to our human tendencies to charge God with the responsibility for the things that go wrong, God is always right. Let God be true and every man a liar. Matthew 28, 18 to 20 gives us a command. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. We usually read the great gospel commission from verse 19 as I just did. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. But it is a catastrophic mistake to read the gospel commission and exclude verse 18. Let me explain why. Listen to verse 18. And Jesus came and spake unto them saying, All power is given unto me. Where? In heaven and in earth. Now, heaven and earth is a biblical expression for everywhere. Because no one will argue that Jesus, there is a place somewhere in the universe where Jesus has no power. No one can say that. So heaven and earth means everywhere. Jesus has power even in hell. And so he said, all power, not some, all, is given unto me in heaven and earth. Then grammatically speaking, for those of you, you all teach English, so you teach grammar. He says, go ye therefore. What is the grammatical function of the word therefore? What is the structural role of therefore? In verse 19, it connects verse 19 to what was said in verse 18 more than connection because you can connect two things that are unrelated as so many marriages are <laughs> but therefore connects two things that should follow logically one from the other are you with me and so Jesus says let me Give you the words of Christ with one word added in. 
And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, Because all power is given unto me in heaven and earth, go ye therefore. And so the command to go is based upon the prior assurance that the person sending you has more power than the opposition you'll face. Not only does he have more power, he has all power. All Satan has is really, if you look at it, permission. In last day events, page 243, uh, why did you turn the lights on? <laughs> Who turned them on? Please turn them off. Things all in my eyes. Just turn them off, just turn them off, my handsome brother. Yes, yes, cut them, cut them, kill them, do whatever is necessary. Uh, thank you very much. God bless you and your family. In Last Day Events, page 243, paragraph 4, Ella White writes these words. The same destructive power exercised by, evil, by holy angels when God commands will be exercised by evil angels when God permits. Which gives us insight into how evil angels exercise power. It is purely by permission. There is nothing Satan can do that God does not allow. Are you with me? And so let's go back now to Jesus Christ. All power is given to me. Jesus has power, does not need permission. Satan needs permission. So that you have Christ on your side as you make your tentative steps to carry out his command. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Let me underscore the power that Jesus Christ has. In Colossians chapter 2 verse 9, the Bible says, For in him, which is Christ, <coughs> excuse me, dwelleth all the power of the Godhead bodily. Since you didn't get it, let me rephrase it. How much power does God the Father have? <coughs> All. How much power does God the Holy Ghost have? All. How much power does God the Son have? All. You take three alls. You combine them and put them where? In Jesus. Do you see why it is such an insult to doubt God? To doubt his power. To panic when you come to the Red Sea. Forgetting it's God who created the sea. And the seas obey him. So when he said, peace be still, the disciples were amazed and they feared exceedingly, Mark 4, 41, saying, what manner of man is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Because he has all power. In him dwelleth the power of the Godhead bodily. And so we have the power of God on the right side and the challenges you're facing. Here's what human beings do. It's a natural tendency of the flesh to focus on the problem, not on the power. And so when three armies came against Jehoshaphat, in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, Jehoshaphat began to pray from verse 5 or 6, and he got to the end of the prayer in verse 12. He said, O oh, our God, will thou not judge them? For we have no might against this great company that cometh against us, neither know we what to do. This is the company coming against us. We have no power. Three armies against one. One army against one is bad enough. Three against one is guaranteed defeat. But he ends the prayer in verse 12 by saying, Our eyes are upon thee. Jesus Christ has all power to deal with all difficulties. Hebrews tells us in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 25, by faith they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land. Which the Egyptians are saying to do, were drowned. In early writings, page 227, paragraph 1, we have these, these unsettling words. Eloi says, I saw. Now, whatever difficulty you may have with Ellen White, when you read where she says, I saw, 
show a little respect for the authenticity of what's following. Now, if you read where she says, I feel, maybe. When you read, I saw, or I was shown, or I was instructed, lay down your human arrogance and accept the divine inspiration. I saw. And if the church had always retained her peculiar holy character, the power of the Holy Spirit, which was imparted to the disciples, would still be with her. Amen. The sick would be healed, devils would be rebuked and cast out, and she would be mighty and a terror to her enemies. We read the book of Acts, and we marvel at the power of the early church. And what our last day prophet is telling us, if we had kept the character of that old early church, the power they had, we would have. There is no reason for God's word to falter and stumble and fail other than our lack of faith and our unwillingness to follow God with exactness. There's a text with which we're all familiar. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Now, the Bible is a holy book. And it was written by whom? Holy men. This is a concept very difficult for us to grasp in the 21st century. Because in our modern world, your character has very little to do with your work. And so you can be an adulterer, an adulteress, a homosexual, a lesbian, and as long as you have a certain talent, you are glamorized, glorified, and people pay lots of dollars to see you either play a game or have, commit fornication on the screen or do something else. Nothing to do with your character. As a matter of fact, the worse your character is, the more you're glorified. I'm saying that to come to this point. It is not enough to do God's work or to attempt to do God's work. The person doing the work must have a character consistent with the character of the work. Can you say amen? amen. We need holy people to do a holy work. And so as we gather this week to look at the challenges the school is facing, we ought to begin not by looking at the school. Looking at us, am I committed? Is the work of God my priority number one? What is our theme song? Nothing between my soul and my Savior. And the Savior's work is as dear to the Savior as anything can be because it's a work of salvation. That's why he came to die and the value of a soul is measured by that cross, and so the work of God is dear to him as his very heart. Promise and power. Jesus assured the disciples, let me tell you who is sending you before you take one step. I have all power in heaven and in earth. This wasn't the first time that Christ spoke words to that effect. In Exodus chapter 20 verse 1, the Bible says, And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of bondage. Now, it takes very little study to realize the voice from Sinai was the voice of Christ. The same man who died on that cross was the one who said, Thou shalt have no other gods before thee. It was Jesus Christ who stood on Sinai and spoke the Ten Commandments of his Father. But he did not begin by saying, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Neither did he begin by saying, Go ye therefore and teach all nations. As he began, all power is given unto me. He says virtually the same thing by reminding the Israelites of who it was that was about to tell them how to live their lives. I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of bondage. What Christ was saying implicitly, I am the one who demonstrated power such as Pharaoh had never seen, or you. I am the one who turned water to blood. I brought frogs upon the land. I brought lice. I brought flies. 
I brought moraine. I brought boils. I brought locusts. I brought hail. I brought a thick, painful darkness. I sent the destroying angel. You saw every one of those expressions of power. I brought you out by a stretched out arm and a mighty hand. I was the one who parted the Red Sea. I turned bitter water into sweet. I sent bread from heaven. I brought water from a rock. I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt. And the same power by which I delivered you, I will enable you to have no other gods before me. And so one can correctly say, as he reads Exodus 20 verses 1 and 2, And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, and out of the house of bondage, and if you will trust me, you will not have any gods before me. Are you with that as a promise? I told you I would talk about what a promise really is. If you truly accept me as the powerful God, you will not make idols. It's not so much thou shalt not, it is thou, let me say differently, it's not so much don't do that, don't do that. It is these things you will never do if you accept me fully. You just won't do that. It's a promise, says God, you will not live that lifestyle. Christ Object Lessons, page 38, paragraph 1. These powerful words from Ellen White. In every command and in every promise of the word of God is the power, the very life of God by which the command may be fulfilled and the promise realized. He who by faith receives the word is receiving the very life and character of God. You didn't get it? Listen again. Let me speak more slowly. In every command and in every promise in the word of God is the power. The very life of God by which the command may be fulfilled and the promise realized. In other words, the power of God is the life of God. He who by faith receives the word is receiving the very life and character of God. And so when Jesus said, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things, not some, not the non-controversial things, all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you all the way, even unto the end of the world. In that word lay the very life of God, because the power of God's word is his life. Education, page 126, paragraph 4. The creative energy that called the world into existence is in the word of God. This word imparts power. It begets life. Very similar to what we read in Christ's Object Lesson, page 30, at paragraph 1. Every command, she says, in education, page 126, paragraph 4, is a promise. Then she goes on to say, accepted by the will. Received into the soul, it brings with it the life of the infinite one. Who is the infinite one? God himself. Accepted by the will. To accept by the will is to submit and surrender to whatever the word says. That is accepting something into the will. Because the will is the cockpit that controls the aircraft of your life and mind. That's where decisions are made. That's what God wants to control. Accepted by the will. Received into the soul. It brings with it the life of the infinite one. It transforms the nature and recreates the soul in the image of God. And so what I'm trying to get across to you is that when Jesus said, Go ye therefore, the power to go and to do what Jesus says is the very life of God which he imparts to you. Through what? Through what? The word. Promise and power. Every promise of God or every command is a promise 
Every promise has power. But if we go back to Hebrews chapter 4 verse 2. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them. All the power of the Father, the Holy Ghost, and of Christ. Which is in every promise of Christ. Did not profit them. Not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. My question to you is this. Don't answer me. Do you believe with all your heart that what you're doing is the will of God? Are you 100% committed to this work? Whether you do it for a year or five. It is not the length of service, it is the quality of service. Are you 100% committed to leading those students to Christ? Whether through direct Bible study or a Christ-like method of teaching in the classroom and a Christ-like demeanor outside of the classroom. God does not accept 99%. It's very impressive at a secular level. It's very impressive in Korea, United States, England, Sweden, Belgium. It is not impressive in heaven. God, for those of you who have studied physiology, when a muscle contracts, every muscle fiber contracts in a way that's called all or nothing. So when you do this in the gym, the fibers in your muscle, they contract with everything they have. I'm giving this example to make a spiritual point. That's the effort God requires of us. Ecclesiastes 9 verse 10, whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. And so my question is to you again, are you committed to this work with all your might? You know, Jesus was talking to a group of Pharisees and a scribe overheard him. And in Mark chapter 12 from verse 28, the Bible says, And one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, and perceiving that he answered them well, asked him, Which is the first commandment of all? And Jesus answered him, said, The first of all the commandment is here, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. Now with everything you have. Jesus says, that's how we love God. But to love God is to serve God. To love God is to obey God. And so Christ says, our commitment to God, our service to God, our obedience to God must be with everything we have. Because God's commitment to our salvation was with everything he had. Withholding nothing. When God gave Christ, he gave everything and had nothing left. Whatever challenges you're facing, the answer lies with God. The problem lies with us. The answer lies with God. The path to the answer is a recommitment of the life to God. Let me ask you some questions. Don't answer me. It's uh, 14 after 5. When did I say I'd let you go? 5.30. I'll try to keep my word. When you make decisions for your personal life, is God your first thought? Don't answer me. The last time you went shopping for clothes, what was your first thought? Will these clothes make me look good? Or will these clothes, when they're on me, reflect my Savior? What was your first thought? When you went to the hairdresser and you said, give me that hairstyle, what was your first thought? The image of God or making my own image? When you decided to come from wherever you came, from Australia, United States, UK, there are certain countries from which you received missionaries I saw on your website. Did you come for the cause of the kingdom, believing that by your concentrated, humble efforts, you may hasten the coming of Christ by one minute? Or did you want an adventure in Southeast Asia? My friends, the things which are impossible with men are possible with God. Every crisis the Israelites faced was a crisis for them. It was an emergency for them, not really for God. The Red Sea was a problem for the Israelites, not God. Thirst was a problem for the Israelites, not God. The lack of food, a problem for the Israelites, not God. But when they trusted God, 
When they did what God said, without offering God creative recommendations, God moved in a miraculous way every day, seven days a week, 40 years. You know, God likes to, God works by miracles. If God is God with all that power, God can't work in ways that are non-spectacular. They may look non-spectacular to us, but God's ways are always spectacular. When you send bread from heaven six days a week and none comes on the seventh day, that is spectacular. The very fact it does not come on the seventh day is as spectacular as the fact it comes on the fifth day. Let God work a spectacular work in your individual lives this weekend. If he can accomplish that, whatever challenges you face will begin to vanish. For years I have heard of your school. This is my first visit to South Korea. And I've always wanted to come and see, have some exposure to this English language institute, this school where people teach English. And where uh, I see pictures on the internet because many South Koreans come to our missionary training program in Michigan. And so they talk about uh, where they come from. And I've always wanted to have some exposure, some experience to this Samuel foreign language school and by God's grace here I am. I was surprised by the fact that you're having challenges. But I've lived long enough and traveled extensively enough and counseled intensively enough to know that there's no problem that God cannot solve. But the solution begins with us. It begins with a recommitment of the life to God and to his mission and to truly ask ourselves is God's work my number one priority I was listening to a message about a year and a half ago it was given at GYC a fellow called Rosario I don't remember his first name I think it was well, I forgot there are a few brothers called Rosario and in his message he said something very true he said if the first century Christians were to awaken from the grave and observe us and our level of commitment they would be shocked and beg to return to the grave now if we could be transported by some beaming machine back 2,000 years to observe them we would all brand them as fanatics Something has happened in 2,000 years. We need to go back to the way it was. And Elohim says before Christ comes, there will be a return to what? Primitive godliness. We will go back to the time when God's work is so clearly number one, it becomes apparent to all those who come into contact with us. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 14, speaking of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and all the patriarchs and the matriarchs, the Bible says, for they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. Listen to the words. For they that say such things, what they said, verse 13, they are strangers and pilgrims on the earth. They that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. Now the word I like there is plainly. By their lifestyles, the unbelievers could see these people were headed somewhere else. Plainly. How plain is it to your friends and your family? How plain is it to your students that your one mission in life is the kingdom of God and his righteousness? If someone has to guess for too long, there's a problem with my commitment. All power, says Christ, is given unto me. And whatever excuse you may have, God has the answer. In Exodus chapter 4, verse 10, reading onwards, when God called Moses, the Bible says, And Moses said unto the Lord, O my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither heretofore, nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant, but I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. God told him, Go speak to Pharaoh. Moses said, I can't speak. I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. The Lord said, Who hath made man's mouth? 
You can't speak, I made the mouth. You're not eloquent, I made the tongue. Who hath made man's mouth? Who established the first school on earth? Tell me. God, where was it held? The classroom was Eden. Who were the students? What was the lesson book? Nature. Now the God who established the first school, he can say to us as he said to Moses, Moses said, I cannot talk. God said, who made the mouth? We may say, our school has problems. God says, who established schools? I did. Schools are a divine invention. I should say schools of the prophets. So whatever the difficulty is, we just need to obey God as Moses needed to obey. And not drive God to the place where the Bible says the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. In verse 14 of Exodus chapter 4. Twenty after five. I want you to do something today, right now. It's not a command. It's a request. But it's an earnest request. Search your heart. Search it. Is God's work your number one priority? I'm not suggesting everyone should be a preacher, a culporter, a Bible worker. My question is, is God's work your number one priority? Whether you're a lawyer, a doctor, a pilot, a housekeeper, whatever it is, if you are a member of God's remnant family, his kingdom must be priority number one. And so Jesus says in Matthew 6, but seek ye first the kingdom of God, and his righteousness. It is possible to run an institution with organizational flawlessness and God has nothing to do with it. So you went to Harvard, you studied organizational management and you bring back those secular skills and you run a school and in the eyes of the world it is well run but God is not in it. Because the good Jesus said, seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And so my question is, almost at a point of irritation, is your commitment to God 100%? If it isn't, make that commitment before you leave today, this place of worship. Not simply for the sake of the Samuel foreign language school, for the sake of your own salvation. For the sake of the effect of your life on the gospel of God in general. For the sake of those who will come into your sphere of influence and be either blessed or cursed. We're told in historical sketches, page 143, paragraph 5, we are all woven together in the great web of humanity. And God holds us responsible for the influence we exert over others. And a half big Christian exerts a destructive influence. And so when I say give God 100%, not for the sake of the school alone, but for the sake of your own life, your walk with Christ, your influence on others, and yes, for the sake of the school. Because many who walk the streets of gold will mark the point of their contact with Christ from the day they set foot on that campus. And so I, as I stand before you as your brother in Christ, as a sinner in need of grace, recommit my life to God. Right now. In the presence of heaven and earth. And I recommit my life to him for one purpose only, broken out into several little. I always tell God for the proclamation of the gospel, the three angels' messages, present truth. I commit my life right now to God to give him all the glory, the praise, and the honor. I want none. I commit my life to God to making sure that he is always presented as a God of love and justice. And I commit my life to God to do what Christ came to do, one of the things he came to do, to magnify the law and make it honorable. I publicly recommit my life to God, putting nothing above God and his work, not family, not friends, not position, not career, nothing. 
I want to seek the kingdom first. Seeking the kingdom first does not eliminate the other things of life. Jesus said, seek them first. Implicit in first is second, third, and fourth. Are you with me? Those things which we currently make first, Jesus says, no, make them second, third, fourth, and fifth. Make me and my business first. That's the commitment I want you to make. So we go through this weekend, different people, as we pray and we strategize and we think and we plead with God, intervene, we do so as people who have recommitted themselves to God. How many of you will say, Father, today, I recommit my life to you and to your work and to your kingdom, as far as I know, 100%. Can I see your right hand? And I'm very serious. Just your right hand. If you've raised your hand, if, stand with me. Second call, it's a little tougher, perhaps. You've been serving the school, missionary teacher. School has about 30,000 students, 44 branches, 200 committed missionaries, as your website says. But it is very possible that in all this frenzy of service, you may have drifted from God. In your own personal life, you may have drifted from God. In all this service you do, one of the greatest barriers to personal growth is church work. Are you with me? The Levite was so busy going to church, he couldn't stop to help. The man on the side of the road in whom God was represented. So my second call is, if you are beginning to realize you have drifted from God in the midst of service, and you want to say, Father, I need to come back before my drift takes me so far that I'm too discouraged to make the effort to come back. If you think you have drifted spiritually from God and you want to say, Father, I admit I have drifted. Please, I want to come back. Hold me tightly that I never drift again. If that applies to you, can I see your hand? If it applies to you, you've drifted. Dazzled by the Asian culture, all the travels you've done, you've drifted. Keep your hands up. Loving Father in heaven, I come to you in the name of Jesus, recommitting my life to you, seeking your mercy and your grace and your sustaining power. Where I myself may have drifted, I ask you, Lord, to bring me back. I offer no opposition, no resistance. Dear God in heaven, register the hands that have been raised in response to the invitation, I have drifted. No time to study God's word. No time to read the writings of Ellen White. No time to sit and meditate upon the word. No time to search one's life with the verse. With the verse. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. Father, register those hands, those decisions. And Father, by the cords of love, bring them back to your bosom. Please, and for all of us who have recommitted our lives to you, dear God, 100%, on the very edges of the Sabbath, accept our commitment. But help us, God, to realize some wisdom you've given us through Ellen White. In Christ's triumphant, page 122, paragraph 3, where she writes, To follow Jesus requires wholehearted conversion at the start, and a repetition of this conversion every day. So, Father, let us come renew this commitment tomorrow and the day after and the day after as it pleases you to prolong our lives. Please, God, bless us. Because we are the school. We are the church. We are the conference. We are the union. It's not brick and mortar. We are the institution. So purify us, dear God. The problem with the temple at Jerusalem was not the temple. It was the Pharisees and the scribes and the Jews. And so Jesus left it. Let him not say to us, your house is left unto you desolate. Please God, help us to remember that the God who brought the Israelites out of Egypt destroyed them in the wilderness for lack of faith. 
And so, Father, as we have recommitted our lives to you today, grant us your spirit anew and afresh. Forget how we've been in the past, dear God. Cast our weaknesses into the sea and empower us brand new to take this new step, to do your work with a fervor, an eagerness that matches and exceeds the work that Satan does to overthrow your work. Let us not allow him to outwork us. Bless the leaders of the school, the administrators. Bless the students who come to learn English, Father. As they are taught, let their lives be touched and their hearts transformed. Bless each person, their families. You know the desires of their hearts granted to them, their Father. Protect us all from harm and danger. And let us, as we conduct ourselves this weekend, do so in such a way that those who observe may be touched by our witness. And as the Sabbath draws on, help us, Lord, to move into that mindset so that we can truly observe the fourth commandment to keep it holy. Bless us, I pray. Bless what's coming later on this evening, I ask. In Jesus' name, let all God's people say, Amen and Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. It's 5.30. Thank God for helping me to keep my word. Remember, if God gives you life tomorrow morning, renew the commitment you just made. God has recorded it. He's taking it seriously. God bless you. Remember, this is a house of worship. Try to remember that. If you really have to engage in some conversation, perhaps you can slip up. But this, because of why we've come, this is a place where we ought to remove our shoes from off our feet. For the place whereon we sit and stand is holy ground. I can only say it, I leave it up to you. God bless you. Amen.